Merit in Science is one of the leading academics in the field of innovation and development. And in this context, uh, Luc has done a lot of work uh, in the area of innovation and development. And so we thought that it was uh, absolutely fitting, important to have uh, Luc uh, as being part of this uh, conversation series on global justice. Uh, and of course, although it seems a bit uh, odd at the beginning to think about uh, global justice in connection with innovation, we do believe that there is a, a strong relation. Uh, and that's why we are really uh, focusing on this topic today. Uh, of course, uh, more often than not, uh, we think about uh, innovation in terms of technology uh, innovation. Um, and, and, and in this context, uh, we have in mind uh, very often when we talk about uh, uh, technological innovation, what uh, this innovation means for growth, development, and the economy in general. But uh, precisely because of this connection, uh, there is certainly a strong link between innovation and global justice, and the topic of our conversation for, for today. And perhaps, look as a way to, to begin our uh, uh, conversation, uh, let us focus on the connection existi existing between innovation, growth, and economic justice. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, today, the world economy is uh, still weak and in trouble. This is the case in developed countries, uh, in Europe and in the US, but also in developing countries. And again and again, we are told, uh, at least in America, that uh, innovation is part of the solution. So it's part, uh, innovation is part of the uh, solution to, to, to generate growth. So first of all, is it true that innovation well, is part of the solution? Well, I think innovation and, and more generally technological change is the, probably the only way out in the long term to increase welfare in our societies. but. If you would put it in terms of growth, the word growth should be translated into sustainable development. Mm -hmm. We are on a path of unsustainable development at the moment worldwide, and it's only by starting to innovate in terms of having more products which are more energy efficient or having a lowering in our ecological footprint as consumers in making sure that development takes place in a sustainable fashion, that the poorest countries are not following our sort of industrialization path by being very strong energy consumers and being wasting many natural resources. If we go on that path, of course, then technological change and, and growth as such is not something which will be beneficial to welfare at the global level. But, but first, just uh, let's start uh, with uh, the notion of innovation uh, itself. I mean, you know, we assume that we know the meaning of innovation, but perhaps why don't you tell us what is, in your view, the best definition possible of what is meant by innovation? Well, by innovation, we mean in general, in the, in the narrow sense, we, we go back to industrial innovation, and we mean really new products, new production processes, new organizational methods, mm -hmm. new even institutions, but which have primarily led to higher growth, have been commercial successes, mm -hmm. and either have led to new products coming into markets, which mm -hmm. have been successful, new processes leading to higher productivity in terms of manufacturing or even in terms of service delivery, or new organizational forms which have led to higher profits within firms or more efficiency in terms of the delivery of particular services. Uh, you could add to this institutions as also as part of new institutions which have led to clearly a better governance, a better way in which government services its citizens within countries. So the whole package of innovation is basically has a connotation of innovation is good for you, like Guinness beer. If you remember the advert of Guinness, uh, the mm -hmm. same thing, Guinness is good for you. There is this idea that innovation is always good for you. And this is behind the vagueness of the term of innovation, which is translated in economic terms as always as being a success, a commercial success. So mm -hmm. you can have innovations which fail, but then, of course, they will not be introduced on markets because basically they failed at the moment of the introduction on markets. Mm -hmm. so and, and this is the notion of innovation, more or less, which yeah. has a strong technological notion to it, but has been broadened over the years to become much more society-based. We can talk also about social innovation. 
And have you witnessed a, 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 qualit a qualitative change in terms of uh, uh, regarding innovation in the past 30 years? I mean, you know, we had previously a conversation with uh, Professor Spence, and he mentioned that somehow what's happening, what has been happening in the, in the past 30 years is, is uh, he talks about ice, high growth and high speed growth. So, uh, from your perspective, uh, uh, have we, are we witnessing, or have been witnessed uh, a, a qualitative change when it comes to innovation in the past 30 years or, or so? with IT and so on? Well, I think we have now an, a process of technological progress, which is much broader and is much more general, including many other features. And to some extent, I think the notion of innovation has broadened the analysis with respect to economic dynamics mm -hmm. to include much other forms of change. And so mm -hmm. the change as we are sitting here and having this conversation today, tonight, today for you, tonight for me, mm -hmm. is a conversation which would not have been possible, say, 50 years ago. And mm -hmm. in this sense, what I'm saying or what you're asking to me would have been, would have obliged me to come and see you sit there with you being physically at the same place. Now mm -hmm. we can do it at a distance. This is, in a sense, is a major innovation because it opens up tremendous opportunities for commercial and also non-commercial interactions. It allows us to communicate at distances, etc. It allows us to, to recall this conversation, to transfer it or to look at it or watch it at another moment in time. In other words, all these are features which are very different from the steam engine mm -hmm. or are very different from a new technology in the sense of a hardware manufacturing product. I think these are the ways in which innovation, also in the way Michael Spence has studied it, has been has had a major impulse to, of course, these technologies such as information communication technologies, which have opened up at the global level access to communication, information, various other forms of interactions at a distance. So, 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 in, so your assessment is that indeed uh, we are witnessing a, a qualitative change, and it is now a new, a totally new ball game in terms of uh, innovation. Absolutely, and, and I mean, I think this new ball game, as you put it, means that we go way out of the traditional economic sphere in which we analyze those things to areas which even enter politics, like mm -hmm. what has happened in terms of the social media and the way people in whatever country in the world more or less have access to Twitter, to Facebook, etc., will mean that we all are much more knowledgeable about what happens elsewhere in the world, but mm -hmm. are also much more knowledgeable what happens next door if we are living, for instance, in a more or less democratic open society than you and I are living here on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, yeah. And so, so earlier in the conversation, you, 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 you said that, yes, there is a connection between innovation and growth. In fact, innovation is a key instrument, for, a key tool for, for growth. But So if we are now experiencing a, a, a qualitative change when it comes to innovation, so what are the implications of this new form or you know, high level of innovation on growth itself today? Well, I think there is an immediate direct form that is that we all know today that innovation and technology underlying the innovation process is the most important factor behind economic growth, more or less at the global level. We see this very much, of course, in the emerging countries where innovation and technology is part of their catching up growth. You could say to some extent that the, the process of the large emerging countries today is really the process we have witnessed in the 50s and the 60s. When I say we, I'm talking about continental Europe, I'm talking about Japan, who have imitated consumption patterns of the United States, who have imitated productivity gains in our factories, etc., and hence witnessed a very rapid catch-up growth in the 50s and the 60s and the early 70s in the last century. To some extent, you see the same pattern now in China, in India, in Brazil, in a number of emerging countries, which is based, again, on a lot of imitation and a lot of own capacity development, as we did in the 50s and the 60s, but which, in addition, has these features of the strong influence of innovation and, in particular, on information communication technologies in terms of having immediate access to global markets, whether at the level of products, agriculture products, manufacturing products, but also in terms of services. Mm -hmm. So this new ball game is allowing much more rapid catching up growth than ever before. Of course, the same institutional knowledge is needed as we had it in terms of the way of, I will come back to that, I'm sure, in terms of the issues of global 
governance with respect to the conditions for such rapid catch-up growth, but the conditions are there thanks to this combined element of innovation and technology associated with information, communication, transport technologies, and the way it has influenced all our global interactions. So, so uh, Luc, in essence, you are saying that somehow uh, innovation, the way it has taken place in the past uh, 20 years and so on, has played a, a, a critical role, a strategic role in the high growth that emerging countries have, have encountered? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm absolutely convinced of this. Uh, of course, that it has accelerated the easiness by which they caught up with us in the mm -hmm. sense of, you know, there's never one factor on its own, but the complementarity between these countries becoming members of the WTO, hence becoming also large trading partners, opening up their markets and having access to our markets on the one hand, with the combination of having access to our communication and information systems with the combination of imitating production processes, having factories which still could run with cheap labor, with all the opportunities, etc., of transport systems, etc., has led to this massive growth, which we've witnessed uh, the world, going back to the world figures, we have witnessed over the last 12, 15 years, we have witnessed the largest, the highest world growth ever in history of humankind. So, so, so information technology, because this is what you are talking about, somehow has brought economic openness to a new, uh, new, uh, new level. Absolutely, and this is the the characteristic of this 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 information communication technologies is really that it makes transparent global markets. So whether you are a firm located in New York or you are a firm located here in the Netherlands, you will be able to identify suppliers or elements in your production at home where you can find cheaper delivery of particular mm -hmm. elements. You will build contracts with those firms. So the value chain itself has become globalized. Mm -hmm. And this global value change is what has witnessed the concerns, of course, very much in the US, but also in Europe about deindustrialization, about the shifting away of elements of this value chain to other countries, to emerging countries, but has opened up at the same time dramatic growth opportunities for those countries using their own comparative advantages, as we call it, namely the low labor costs they have in these countries, the access to large numbers of skilled, semi-skilled people, and the way, of course, they have set up new factories, etc., and new production methods, copying some of ours. So all this process mm -hmm. has been characteristic of this tremendous boom in world economic growth, as we have witnessed over the last 15 years. But what you are alluding to here, Luke, is also a bit of a challenge for developed countries because IT has allowed somehow for developing countries to have access to markets in ways which were not possible before. It has allowed to really bring its, uh, its products uh, uh, in the developing world uh, in ways which were not existing before. So, you know, uh, so it's a bit of a, of a minus for, uh, for developed countries. So how do we go about this? Well, growth... In sense at the world level has of course been unequal and it's very clear that the highest world growth levels and, and performances have been achieved by the very large emerging countries and in this sense of course the developed countries the OECD countries as a whole but many of the European countries have witnessed much lower growth rates and have witnessed major difficulties of course in terms of internal problems they had in Europe, of course, the, all the problems associated with the single market, and in particular the European or the economic and monetary union and all the implications there, the lack of institutional fitting in this area, etc. We can come back to this, which is specific to Europe. Yeah. But you've seen that these countries talk about the some of the other uh, countries in the southern part of Europe talk even about the Middle East, which have not witnessed these very high growth performance for other reasons because they haven't incorporated within their societies these changes mm -hmm. with respect to those new technologies, not mm -hmm. in the same way as China has done, as India has done, as Brazil has done, and as even a number of African countries have done. So precisely in, in the context of the work of UNU Merit, when you think about uh, uh, innovation, of course you don't simply focus on the uh, technological side of innovation, you want to really think about innovation in a social context as 
uh, as uh, as contributing to uh, an inclusive and, and fair growth and so on. So when you think about this in the context of your own work, in the context of your colleagues' work, uh, do you uh, um, you know do you think about um, uh, innovation in a differentiated manner? That is to say, okay, this is what innovation uh, is likely to has to be to, to be to be able to generate positive product uh, pro, pro, positive effects in a, in a developed country setting and this is what innovation has to be uh, in order to generate positive uh, effects in a developing country setting do you think about these things and how do you go about uh, designing the agenda and, and so on and so on yes I think this is the most fundamental distinction with the previous notions of technological change yeah. as they were popular remember in the 60s and the 70s we talked about technological change, and we talked about transfer of technologies to developing countries, and we talked even about appropriate technologies. Mm -hmm. And my predecessors, et cetera, here at UNU Merit, which was then called UNU Intech, had a lot of research done on appropriate technologies. Mm -hmm. The big difference uh, between appropriate technologies and what you could say appropriate innovation is that when we talked about technologies, we were talking very much about a relatively linear vision about technological progress. The machines we are using today here in, in our exchange are of a better quality, are of a technological next generation as the, say, ISDN connection lines we would have 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so technological progress is linear, so to say, and each time you progress over time. And so the problem about development and technology is one of time. Mm -hmm to set up a new steel plant, well, you have a new steel plant. The steel plant you set up in Venezuela or the steel plant you set up in Nigeria is a steel plant going to be which has a too high capital equipment and knowledge equipment compared to the labor force you can use in that plant. So you must think of, do I find appropriate technologies, older steel plants which have more employment and less capital possibly need? These were the discussions we had in the 60s and the 70s, and they raised lots of issues about high tech leading to no employment and low tech being more leading to more employment, etc. And Amartya Sen, also a Nobel Prize winner in, in, in economics, has written a book on this, which was called The Choice of Techniques back in the early 60s. This was the debate. If you talk about innovation, you talk about something very different. You talk about as you mix up both knowledge existing technologies, new technologies, but also the local context, the organization issues, you talk about something which could well consist of a set of existing technologies which you combine in different ways and satisfy local needs. Mm -hmm. Developing solar panels in villages in Africa or developing mobile phones to communicate with each other to, in terms of financial transmissions or as a security object Etc. are ways in which you use existing technologies in totally different contexts. So mm -hmm. your point that innovation has a very different implication in every developed context, in a high developed context, with a high developed context which has infrastructure, which has safe, a safe financial system with institutions which are all trustworthy and well established, etc. Innovation in such a context will often, in general, free ride on those institutions. It will use the networks of having guaranteed electricity as we have it today, guaranteed internet communication as we have it today, guaranteed water if I want to have a drink, etc. All this is there, and that infrastructural inf infrastructure is absolutely essential for adding each time innovations which are dependent on that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But if you are within a purely developing, the poorest, say, developing context you can imagine, where you don't have any of those infrastructures, you suddenly observe that actually the innovation could well be driven by exactly the opposite, which could mean autonomy. Can that's I have the, a small... That, that's the example of the cellular phones in, in Africa. Exactly. Yeah. The, the mobile phone is the first example of autonomy, autonomy in terms of not being dependent on a physical terrestrial infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But think of what, for instance, to give you where, of course, innovation often comes from, the American army is very much experimenting with how I can capture solar energy on the clothing of military personnel in terms of capturing it for their iPods, their iPhones, for the various electronic equipment. So this is, again, the same principle of autonomy. I want to become autonomous in desert situations from electricity infrastructure, 
I can use the solar power and I have to transfer the solar power in small batteries, which I can use for the various equipments I have. Mm -hmm. And hence, you can continue in the same line. That is that there is really a revolution taking place in many R&D labs, which is focusing very much on, can I develop technologies which have all the characteristics of being totally autonomous of the infrastructure we have typically in a developed country, and for which there are huge markets in emerging countries and in developing countries. That's just one example, but you have lots of those examples in the same vein. So, so uh, what you are telling us, Tricia, is that uh, uh, on the one hand, the nature and the role and the impact of innovation is somehow contextual. You know, it, it's not the same depending on, 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 on the context. But also what you are telling us that somehow, uh, while, for instance, in, in, the, in the setting of developed countries, uh, high level of development can be a, a, a base on which you build for, for innovation, it can be also an impediment for innovation because in the process you can have uh, you know, vested interests and so on and so on. So how do you, and, and, and uh, same thing for developing countries, you don't have infrastructure, so therefore you can leapfrog and go to cellular phone, but you know, how do you, you know, uh, draw the line? Uh, in terms of uh, existing systems on which you build to go further, uh, and so it's a positive dynamic, and lack of systems uh, which you leapfrog to really... Uh, so how do you, you see what I mean, how do you draw the line to make it a dynamic well, situation? I, yes, well I think that it's, it's important to maybe start from the notion that innovation is characterized by what Josef Schumpeter called creative destruction. Mm -hmm. And this notion of creative destruction makes immediately very clear that in very highly developed countries, the extent of allowing creative destruction to occur in order to get dynamics is challenging us. It's challenging those elements of society which are being put into question. Yeah. The notion of creative destruction means basically that we allow certain firms, certain habits, certain institutions to be destroyed for the benefit of all. But the idea is still that the creative dynamics will be larger than the destruction of these couple of elements. Mm -hmm. So it is the allowing some change for the benefit of all and at the expense of a few. So in a developed country context, this becomes as you grow richer, more welfare, more sophisticated, more combined by all kinds of infrastructures, it becomes much more difficult each time to have these changes occurring as the destruction potential becomes, of course, more significant. In an emerging country, the possibilities of leapfrogging, as you put it, of catching up, of growing mm -hmm. much faster are much higher because the nature of the creative destruction is much different, is very different, and is much more of a nature of creation being much stronger because you are in this phase of catching up growth. Now, mm -hmm. the second point I would like to make is that, of course, when we talk about systems, complex systems like communication systems, like financial systems, like education systems, like health systems, then of course creative destruction raises even more fundamental issues. And as I put it once, uh, I know this is playing on words and it could sound semantic, but you could argue that creative destruction becomes destructive creation. Mm -hmm. And by destructive creation, I mean, I mean exactly the opposite of creative destruction. That is, that it is to the benefit of a few and at yeah. the cost of everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do you precisely avoid this? Because this is key, because I guess that in the context of, of your research, in the context of the work of you and you merit, you know, for, for you, innovation, it's, it's, it's not an end in itself. It's a, it's a means to think about uh, uh, how do we achieve uh, social justice, economic justice, and so on and so on. So how do we avoid uh, this uh, process of uh, uh, destructive, you call it destructive creation? Yes. Well, how I do think we... this is one of the... This is one of the most fundamental uh, challenges we are confronted with. I mean, I would argue that, and, and uh, I mean, the, the example where we have witnessed this is, of course, financial innovation. We have I was going to mention it, yes. Well, the, the, the financial innovation is really the example of innovations which, at the time they were developed, introduced into the market, were considered extremely innovative, mm -hmm. extremely creative, very well thought over in terms of the underlying mathematics, in terms of the underlying principles. If you think simply of concepts such as securitization, it is trying to make more secure 
particular financial products and broadening the risks, as to say, to a second layer or a third layer. Now, the whole issue, and this is exactly the same in any other system or network system, is that if you take two nodes which are the most profitable in your system and you actually subtract them from the system and you provide a service between those two nodes, you will see that it could be at the expense of the whole of the system. In other words, two, if you think of two telecommunication or two transport systems where you make it between the, the most important nodes, the two cherries, so to say, of the network system, and you extract them out of the system and you make profits out of those two nodes, you can well imagine that all the rest of the system, which is dependent on the interactions with those mm -hmm. nodes and are basically subsidizing or being subsidized by those, those two nodes, that the whole system collapses. If you put this back into financial terms, you could say that some of those products which were developed were basically pushing the risks to the other elements of the financial system by picking out certain products, etc., and that to some extent the systemic risks were increasing dramatically. Mm -hmm. The risks of the product were less, but the, the, at the cost of the systemic risk. So what you typically had was a phenomenon whereby the few persons or the few banks or financial institutions developing these products were benefiting from it at a dramatic level in terms of creating new markets, mm -hmm. thanks again to information communication technologies. But the system as such became a much less controlled and much more risky system as a whole. Our financial okay. system was really questioned and, and was declined in terms of its reliability and in terms of its security. And, and what kind of growth was it uh, creating? Not a sustainable one for sure, and not a, a shared one, and not a productive one either. No, this is, this is where, in this area, to come back to your, your previous question, the issue is really between innovation and governance. Mm -hmm. If you have innovation, like in these cases of systems, whereby the innovation is triggered by the regulation. You are basically, you have a regulatory system, we have information communication technologies, which are allowing us to do more than what's whatever foreseen in the regulation. So what we will do, we will use the new information communication technology to circumvent a particular regulatory element. Mm -hmm. We go alongside the bottleneck as we perceive it in terms of the system. Mm -hmm. The problem, though, is that we don't know to what extent going beside the bottleneck, as in the case of financial mm -hmm. innovation, hasn't created an enormous, say, leakage after the system, so to say, which means that the whole system collapses. And this is continuously the problem, is that what you need, basically, when you have innovation in network services, in systemic network services, you continuously need to have the interaction between the creative innovators, those destructive mm -hmm. creators and the regulatory operators. And, and, and the and regulatory so operators must need the technology and the knowledge to be able to continuously balance and be in line with those innovative creators. Mm -hmm. If they are way behind, like the financial regulation was, certainly at the global level, the whole system collapses. But in, in, in essence, uh, Luc, you are, you are saying that uh, uh, innovation for, for being uh, a productive uh, activity needs to be uh, benefiting from, uh, from, from governance, for sure. So that it, it, it becomes really uh, um, um, productive destruction and so on and so on. So, so then the question is, what are the principles of, of, of this governance uh, which are required for innovation to be productive, and, and what are the mechanisms of this governance? So, you know, what are the principles which would be guiding us to make innovation um, positive, productive, constructive uh, uh, in society, with in mind, you know, uh, values, norms, and having to do with uh, the demands of social and economic justice? So what, are these, what would be these principles? Well, I, if I may say so, I would start simply from the basic... Uh, principles of uh, liberté, fraternité, égalité, in the sense mm -hmm. access is a first basic principle. The regulator must guarantee equal access. We have these principles about a universal service. Mm -hmm. We have this, if you look at all our systems, when, whether we talk about transport systems, whether we talk about telecom systems, whether we talk about financial systems, whether we talk about postal service, etc., in each of these areas, we have set up network systems. These network systems 
by definition that if you live in New York, the cost of your network will be, in principle, very small, as opposed if you live somewhere in a very peripheral region. Yet the principle we have as a society, whether in the United States or whether in most other countries, is that we say we want the person in a peripheral region to have equal access as the person in New York to all those services which are indicated, despite the fact that the costs of providing this service to a peripheral person is 10 times higher, maybe 100 times higher. So the principle of equal access is a first fundamental principle. Uh, uh, well, if no, you, if you, 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 uh, Luke, universality of access at equal cost. That's what you're saying, in fact. Yes. Yeah, okay. Universal access, well, the issue about cost is a different issue. You must guarantee the access you can provide subsidies if you want to transfer it in terms of real cost, etc. But this issue about universality in terms of access is one of the principles of our societies. If we don't do this, we will all live in urban, whole, in urban areas and the whole countryside, there will be nobody living there. Mm -hmm. So the whole issue about the geographical dimension is an essential feature of where, as a society, we have decided that equal access is a fundamental issue. If you don't follow this line, and you see this very much in transport systems, maybe less in the US than here in Europe, you will think if you privatize a railway station or a railway transport system or a bus system, very quickly you will see that by the economics principles of a network, the most important nodes in terms of density will be connected. Mm -hmm. But the nodes of where there is very low density will be quickly dis dismantled and no longer available. And that will be at the cost of small villages yeah, in mm -hmm. Western Brittany or wherever, where there will be no more services of postal services, banking services, other services, etc. Et so as a society, as a government, you would like to maintain this system of delivery of services, and you can do this two various ways. You can either provide a subsidy to the carrier of the service. If he's private, you can either keep it in the public sphere, but you can see that if you allow innovation just like this, to operate, the destructive creators will simply pick out, back to my cherries, they will mm -hmm. pick out the nodes, the most useful commercial nodes of the service, and they will just deliver the service between those nodes, and yes. that's the commercial interesting element at the cost, at the worsening the rest of the system. So in, the pro in system in the, terms, yes. access is a, is a crucial issue. So universality uh, of access, say, so universality of access first principles. Is, I, I would say the second thing would be freedom, of course, the freedom of information in the way, mm -hmm. well, I mean, we, we can come to this in terms of global justice, but if you see what happens in terms of the social, the use of the social media in Northern Africa is an example, certainly one of the major examples of a major innovation in mm -hmm. the political sense of the revolt of youngsters of having access to each other into Facebook, having access to the world in knowing what is democracy and free information, etc., and making a revolution following whatever the reasons are for that revolution as it occurred, whether it was the the uh, the, uh, the person the, the the Tunisian who who burned himself uh, when he got mm -hmm. again uh, was refused to sell fruit uh, on on the market in Tunis. So these issues are clearly that the the way in which the social media, the Twitter, the Facebooks, the, the Google, etc., have allowed democracy and openness and transparency is a second issue. And you see very clearly that in there, we are touching on, on quite some fundamental issues about local justice in countries with dictatorial regimes. Again, this is an area where I would say that if the response is going to be now control on access controlling the persons who are behind the bloggers, the mm -hmm. other persons providing the information, etc., limiting that freedom, cutting off the access in terms of the freedom to information. Think of everything what has happened globally in terms of some regimes have responded to what has happened in Northern Africa, etc. You can see that the liberty, the freedom of access, the freedom of information here, and the freedom of communication is a second fundamental principle, I would do, argue, and the do, do we have a third principle? Well, the, the, the issues which I would, I would sort of uh, 
uh, reflect on is, of course, th they are more economic in nature, which could be that you say that you always have as a principle, that is that the regulator looks at competitive behavior, so that there is no monopoly pricing and other features, which is more, you could say, a little bit under the notion of equality, uh, could be there uh, as, as a notion uh, in terms of that prices are set in a competitive setting. Networks lead you to monopoly pricing. Mm -hmm. That is, Michael Spence would have told you everything about this if he still would be there with us. Mm -hmm. And clearly, in, in terms of networks, it is the need for a controller agency. We have controlling agencies in telecoms. We have them in railroads. We have them in terms of financial activities, because automatically, the tendency that you can have a network means basically that as you add more people to your network, your costs, etc., your average costs will be able, you can spread them over a much larger set of people. And you have this famous Metcalf law, which means that a large network will be by definition, hence a monopoly network will be by definition much more cheaper, much more efficient than very small networks. So I we have a logic of networks which we want, because we mm -hmm. want cheap prices, but we want to then have a controlling agency to make sure that there is not a behavior, a monopoly behavior behind it, but that it's simply a natural monopoly, as we call it. So, so I pick up three principles which, uh, in your view, are supposed to be at the core of the governance of innovation to make sure that innovation uh, somehow uh, has a productive, positive, socializing uh, impact. In fact, is part of generating public goods. So universality, freedom of access, uh, and uh, competitive behavior. Oh. What, uh, what are then the institutions and the mechanisms which uh, allows us to, 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 to uh, you know, embed these principles? I mean, how do we make sure that these principles, these three principles, are, 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 I mean, are part of the society uh, uh, in which we live? Well, this is where we lack, of course, the global institutions. Uh, mm -hmm. You certainly can say that we have in, in the OECD developed countries with the notions of democracy there, you can see that these three principles are basically part of UN member states becoming part of the OECD. You have mm -hmm. to satisfy some of those criteria. You see also that the World Bank has emphasized these as fundamental conditions also, huh, in terms mm -hmm. of the traditional democracy principles, the principles in terms of property rights, of allowing mm -hmm. people to establish businesses, etc. All these principles are similar to those. Um, where I think it raises fundamental issues, and that is certainly the witness what we've witnessed in the Middle East or in the MENA country, the North African Middle Eastern area, is of course that we've had regimes there which did certainly not follow those principles, and that to some extent, the, the, what has happened in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, in Libya, uh, what is happening today in Yemen and what seems to be happening in Syria in, this, in these countries are all regimes where clearly um, the dynamics of innovation combined with, of course, the world food shortages, combined with the very large youngster population which has no view on its, any of its future, etc., mm -hmm. is prepared to revolt. Mm -hmm. and is doing this in a violent way, but in a violent way in terms out of despair. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear that in each of these countries, you see that it is the lack of having an institutional setup which would correct or would have signaled to those regimes that basically, in terms of the principles to global access, global freedom, global competition, etc., that some of those principles were clearly not being developed, and that by this, in addition to the fact that none of these countries had witnessed basically any growth, except so media uh, growth, so with, so with the oil growth, it is witnessing this, this major failure. Yeah, in fact, you are telling us that not only that in, in these countries, you know, we don't have the principles which would allow innovation to, to, to serve a, a positive purpose, but in fact, we don't even have the, 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 the context which would, innova which would allow innovation to, 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 to appear. So, in fact, you are telling us that, you know, innovation doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't emerge uh, out of nothing. It requires a proper context. So, w what are the the, 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 the the conditions for innovation to emerge and therefore play its positive role in developed countries and in developing countries? I mean, so, because I think that it's probably quite different 
the nature of the context in, in you know for innovation to 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 continue and so on and so on. So, what is required for a context to make innovation even possible, let alone positive? Well, I think that the first, in traditional innovation theories, we always look first at demand, in the sense of the need. Is there a mm -hmm. need? And it's very clear that why India, China, Brazil are, are today very much on a growth path with a lot of innovative activity and, and of all sorts, of, of various using existing technology, also reusing technology, inventing within different local contexts, etc., is based on simply needs, demand. There is a massive demand from the population in terms of economic growth, in terms of higher welfare, in terms of more material production, more houses, more education, more needs, uh, whatever, from at the whole range. Mm -hmm. So the point is that you can also translate this need, in, in, again, in terms of the, our North African case, as the need of youngsters of having no jobs. And the fact that they have not just no jobs, but that their entrepreneurial creativity is continuously frustrated by corruption, by all kinds of other features of regulation which is preventing anything and always allowing entrepreneurship to an elite or to a particular political class. Well, these elements have, of course, been frustrating so much youngsters that the revolt is based, of course, on a need, which is a need of jobs, a need of mm -hmm. growth, a need of opportunities, of expectations, aspirations which youngsters have. If you view this in terms of our needs and, and in our welfare society, well, this is where we see the mismatch. The, mm -hmm. the markets and the economic system at the moment no longer signal in the same extent those needs as they would do in emerging countries or in poor countries. And we do have a, a large set of societal needs where markets are basically failing or are non-existent. And this mm -hmm. is our big problem in the developed country world, where what we call often societal needs, social innovation, etc., are elements where we all know that some elements don't exist in our society, that we have very strong needs, but that is absolutely no response Me. because either the markets are not existing or the regulation doesn't allow it to you to emerge. G give us a concrete example of this. Well, let me give you a very concrete example. I would say that at the moment there is one sector in our societies which has a negative rate of return, as we call it as economists, where the, 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 the societal rate of return to the investment we carry out there is negative. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's prisons. Prisons? Because what we, prisons, yes. what we basically do is we put youngsters with often light criminal behavior into secure environments and they come out with heavy criminal behavior. Uh -huh. We have a negative, I'm talking really about the prison service itself. And as a society, whether, I mean, I can't talk about the US because I don't know the US prison system that well, I know it only from movies, so that might not be a very good basis. Yeah. But if you look at the, the, the European prison system, you typically have a system where it's basically based on the fact that we as a society have decided that these are people which we have to put in secure environments. That's all. For the rest, we are not interested what happens in those environments, whether they learn anything, whether they come out more criminal than when they came in, etc. I think this is a scandal. Mm -hmm. This is a, there is such a need to make prisons, basically prisons you should make as the best practice education establishments. Mm -hmm. the so, so, the, so, in, so in essence, Luke, you are saying that there is a low return on investment on the way we, we, we handle uh, prisons. For instance, yes, there yeah, is an no, incredibly no, I, I, low rate of investment. And if you were, and this is lots of the ideas which are coming within the framework of social innovation, is that can we not design ways in which we don't ask public authorities to fund prisons, but where we have financial instruments such as social impact bonds or community investment bonds, which will invest in prisons through possibly even private partners, universities. I mean, you should once interview people at Northampton University in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. where basically they specialize in providing entrepreneurship courses in prisons. Mm -hmm. So you just so mentioned... The, yeah, no, no, the, it's, the, it's, the the purpose is basically, as, as goal, you put to 
the prison authorities to introduce delivery services which reduce the recidive rate, mm -hmm. say by half or by 10, so that what you purpose as a service delivery in the prison is how do I reduce the rate of having criminal behavior once they come out by 10. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a perfectly societal innovation. It no, would no, be a see, fascinating no, exercise no, 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 to no, no, do, no, no, no. and the impact on society would be very significant. Yet we don't have markets, we don't have financial instruments, etc., to operate and to introduce these sort of features. This is what I, why I would say that innovation in a societal dimension in developed countries, but for sure also in developing countries, but in our societies, etc., these are a typical example of where we don't pay any attention to and where clearly we need innovation. No, no, this is a very good point, and, and, and you mentioned the notion of social innovation. So, so how do you, you know, how do you use uh, technology or technological innovation as a way to, to generate precisely uh, social innovation and political innovation so that you can make society better and more productive and more optimal? I mean, how do you go from technology innovation to social and political innovation? Because clearly, you know, uh, if a society as a whole is not uh, socially, politically dynamic, uh, there is uh, little chance that you're going to have uh, technology innovation. So, and, and, so, and the reverse is also true. So how do you uh, use uh, technology, innova technology innovation to generate social and political innovation? Well, let me, let me start by trying to answer this, because this is a very difficult one, and mm -hmm. it takes me a long time, yeah. is to say that this, what, what you're getting at now is one of the most fundamental issues we have ignored in the field of, of my field of invention and innovation. Yeah. And that is that eco economists and politicians have been obsessed with the rate of inventive activity, the volume, the amount of research we carry out. Do we carry out sufficient research? Do we invest sufficiently in higher education, etc.? So we've been continuously obsessed with investing large percentages of our gross domestic product of firms' profits and revenues in research, in innovation. What you are hinting at is the other element which people haven't paid attention since 50 years, and which is the direction of inventive activity. In, yeah. in 1962, uh, Richard Nelson, a professor at Columbia University today, wrote or was edited rather this book of the National Bureau of Economic Research, which was called The Rate and Direction of Inventive Activity with contributions there of Kenneth Arrow, Nobel Prize winners of various sorts, etc. And that book was really written in 62, in the midst, of course, of the Cold War, and in the midst of the debate about Sputnik, space programs, and others. And at that time, in the 60s, the issue, certainly in the US, was central about that investing in research raises automatically the political issue about investing in what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, there was the debate at that time later on of the moon and the ghetto. Mm -hmm. The moon and the ghetto debate was we can send a guy to the moon, but we can't seem to solve our ghetto integration problems. So do you put more research in the social inclusion, addressing social inclusion and social research on how to improve our integration in society, or do we put research on sending people to Mars today? This debate is a political debate. This is nothing to do with economics. Markets are not going to give you any indication about whether you want to invest in prisons and increase the way in which you reduce criminality as such, or whether you would invest in terms of um, yeah, but if you if you uh, look if you think uh, look if you think about these things, for instance, if you think about you know what would be the conditions under which we're going to be having a, a better return or a, a rate of, of return investment in, in our handling of prison, then, you know, we're going to have people leaving prisons who, who will be then afterwards uh, productive citizens. So it, 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 it uh, yes. and we can assume that it, uh, it, it, it improves the market, it strengthens the market, it widens the market, and so on and so on. So it's not as if it didn't have an impact on the market. So the question is, uh, why is it that we're not really paying attention to uh, the link between uh, uh, technology innovation and, and, and the need for social innovation. Why is it that we're not paying attention to this? No, I, I, 
Well, I think this is because we have we are short sighted. We we because you see the same arguments about the moon, of course. I mean, the mm -hmm. feedback from the technologies we have developed to go to the moon is, of course, such that it has led to all these other new technologies and new technology insights, etc., both in terms of space and telecommunication and in mother, many other areas. So we are suffering today from a rate of return vision which is short term and which is private. Mm -hmm. And in our societies, and I mean, we do have in Europe, I don't know the situation in the US, but in Europe, we do have a very strong debate today on what is called grand challenges, so-called societal challenges, which of course, the first one being climate change, which is, if there is ever an example of, I mean, when I gave you the example of criminal offense, well, clearly climate change is the most dramatic example of whereby we know that we have a major scientific, technological innovation problem in terms of solving it or in trying to solve it or at least control it in terms of mm -hmm. reducing our ecological footprint. Well, in this area, clearly, we need all the resources we can in terms of research, in terms of knowledge, etc., to address the issue. And yet again, you can see that we still lack the institutional, the governance in terms of addressing the issue and starting to allocate and not just allocate, but also to experiment, to interact, to exchange research results, and to have these various uh, experimental attempts at seeing what are the implications with various, whether you talk about carbon capture, whether you talk about alternative energy productions, whether you talk about various other ways in terms of renewables, etc. So we have many, I mean, this is one, we can talk about many other areas. If you take aging, another area of a societal challenge, certainly in Europe, in Japan also, well, the whole issue is, again, if you go to an elderly home and you would go to geriatric, sorry for the pronunciation, mm -hmm. uh, homes, etc., you will see basically situations which are a disgrace. Mm -hmm. Because what you will see situations is where you are running homes where basically the Technologies such as televisions are used basically to put people in front of people who will stare at televisions who have absolutely no interaction with that and is basically a method for the nursing or the caring personnel to carry out all their other activities. Mm -hmm. We have no innovations in elderly homes. And yet it's very clear that if you were introducing in elderly homes, and you've witnessed, I don't know if you saw some of those Japanese television programs yeah. where they show where they show these robots, these small machines, which are like little animals, robotic mm -hmm. animals, which make noises when you caress them. And you give them to these elderly people. Uh, well, you see the impact is incredible. Mm -hmm. You see elderly people, which have, of course, various diseases and are in, in, in phases of dementia, etc. But you see that they need the caring and the feeling and giving interactions with these kind of small little robots, which they never want to leave, they want to keep with them. And you see the, the welfare increases nearly visible on the physical face of those people. And yet we have no market, no organization addressing the issue of how do we improve the welfare of elderly people in elderly homes. And, and, and is, it, is it because somehow we don't think enough about the the, the innovation for what and the connection existing uh, between innovation and the values that uh, this innovation would want to, 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 to serve? Yes, absolutely. I think you put it well. We, we are doing as if innovation, the valorization of innovation is purely a commercial issue in terms of funding and money mm -hmm. and money raising, etc. And I think we have a lot of areas where there is a welfare increase where either it's not expressed in money terms simply because there are no markets what we call invisible markets, if you want to put in those terms. Alternatively, there is no market power or various other. Yet these are as much needs as they exist in other parts of our society, so, so, and these are needs which we should, in my view, should address. So, uh, uh, if I understand, if I understand you, understand you correctly, uh, Luke. So, in fact, you are telling us that, in a way, for the moment, we are uh, using and uh, envisioning innovation as a, a system of shooting in the dark. I mean, you were trying this, trying that, and, and without really 
thinking what kind of values we are servicing while you are maybe calling for a better system in the context of which we would identify, okay, what is meaningful for us, what is valuable for us, and how do we put innovation at the service of what makes sense, what has meaning, what is valuable for us as, as individuals, as society, as... Uh, is, is it what you are saying? Well, let me, let me put a slight nuance. I mean, it's not shooting in the dark. We have, on the one hand, we have economics, which provides us guidance. We have mm -hmm. private, private rates of return, okay? and we can fail and we can be successful, etc. But ultimately, we have a rate of return to the innovations when we produce new products, etc. Huh? An iPod, yeah. or etc., as a new product, is a fascinating product, providing a lot of increase in welfare, a lot of benefits to the consumers, allowing to do all sorts of things which are highly beneficial to them. So the first is the market-driven process, and I don't want to ignore that at all. Rather, I want to say that that is the first element, etc. The only thing I'm saying is that that is not all. There is mm -hmm. outside of that market-driven process which at the global world level is having had a major impact in terms of economic growth and increasing welfare, there are all these other issues of societal challenges, starting with sustainability, starting with energy, starting with energy consumption and fossil fuel consumption in, in particular, starting with the issues I mentioned in terms of elderly or prisons or all these other social areas where we desperately lack innovative dynamics where we are still as if we are in the Middle Ages. So, 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 I'm, I'm trying to, 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 you know, to get the, the, the essence of it. So, in a way, you, you think that uh, uh, innovation so far is too much about perhaps creating new needs and, and uh, all these with uh, in mind uh, economic incentives and perhaps not enough attending to already existing or emerging needs, both as individuals and as society. And if we don't really look after these uh, uh, existing or emerging needs, we're going to be in trouble, both as individuals and as societies. Is it what you're saying? Well, this is more or less what I'm saying. We will be in trouble because there will become a distance between society, people, individuals, no longer recognizing them in those commercial needs in terms of their real needs. Mm -hmm. So the real needs of people of whatever, their local environment being secure, mm -hmm. their local environment being easily accessible, mm -hmm. the issue of having user friendliness in terms of using equipment. We got mm -hmm. easily connected here, but often I can imagine that people, elderly people again, might have very strong difficulties in getting access to various communication equipment because of the complexity of the system. Mm -hmm. Think of the way the whole low-skilled classes in our society are deconnecting from a lot of activities which require too high skills for them to participate in. Mm -hmm. So we are at risk on the verge of a complete move into the direction of rejecting innovation, change, te new technologies, because they are at a too far distance in terms of not responding to these real societal needs which we talked about. That's the danger we are running. So, you know, we're, we're uh, approaching the end of our conversation. So if you had to, uh, to, to establish a, a wish list of, uh, of how uh, innovation uh, should go about for the coming years as a way to precisely connect better innovation and values, innovation and, and strategic needs, in fact, because that's what you're talking about, both for individuals and for societies, you know, what would be your recommendations, your suggestions to really have innovation, you know, being put to work in a better fashion? Well, I think we should go back to basically fund only those research activities which have a high social rate of return. Mm -hmm. we, we are today obsessed with competitiveness. We are obsessed, I'm talking now when I'm saying we, I'm talking here mm -hmm. about the Netherlands, the European Union, uh, possibly also the, uh, the United States and the other OECD countries, but it seems that we are focusing our whole discussion on how we can reap productivity gains and new markets through subsidizing, providing funds to private research and development to become technological leading, having technologically leading firms which can increase the position of each of our countries. It's, I, I always reflect back at the, the paper once Paul Krugman, another Nobel Prize winner, wrote on uh, competitiveness, and I would say technological competitiveness, a dangerous obsession, because it's an obsession of 
policymakers and of nations to continuously focus on this, this the way in which we, we support research and development in private firms, etc. Whereas in reality, the economic arguments to do so exist because there is a market failure. There could be underinvestment in research and development in private firms, but it's a secondary argument as opposed to the primary argument, which should be that we invest in those sectors where the social rate of return is high and where the private return, rate of return is low. In other words, where there is a clear no innovation going to occur. And I mm -hmm. gave you some examples of those as the typical yeah. example, sort of more caricatures yeah. rather than, than serious really example. But if you think of climate change, that is of course the example of where we are running dramatic problems in the future and yet we don't seem to organize our public research, which should be fully oriented to this. So my wish list would be quite simple. Fund only research which has this social function, this social rate of return being central. That should be the purpose at the global level of what we should be doing. We will no longer have then conflicts in terms of I'm subsidizing IBM or I'm subsidizing firm whatever Google and you are subsidizing the other firm as a sort of, or, or take Boeing or Airbus if you prefer, as, as more realistic cases in which you are continuously subsidizing the research carried out in both of those firms, etc., to reap uh, large world market shares.